Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. I'm Hannah. I like talking about sex and I like books. And so when I get to combine those two things, we're on to a winner. Recently, and by recently, I mean months ago, at the end of September, I was in Wigtown, which is a small village town place in Dumfries and Galloway, which is in Scotland, southwest Scotland. I was in Wigtown for their book festival. Wigtown is Scotland's national book town. It is the tiniest place in the world and yet has dozens upon dozens of independent bookshops. I have no idea how they sustain themselves, but it is wonderful. I was there to talk about my book, The Hormone Diaries, and in between the events that I had, I just went wandering around lots of amazing, quirky bookshops. It was a glorious time and I documented a lot of the bookshops on my Insta stories. If you are not following my Instagram, you really should be following me on Instagram. Because then you would have known about some of these books months ago. <laughs> and now I'm finally making a video about them. Have I read any of them yet? Well, actually, technically, yes, one of them I read during my degree. So I've like already read it, but I never actually owned it. Anyway, we'll get on to that. So one of the bookshops that I went into was literally called The Bookshop and it had these beautiful stone like spiral book spines like on the outside as like the entrance way to the bookshop which is very cool and they claim to be Scotland's largest bookshop or Scotland's largest secondhand bookshop I'm not entirely sure I don't know whether it's like big in terms of space or just like the amount of books that they have because they have so many books and the owner of the bookshop Sean Bythel is an author himself as well and has written some books about what it's like to be a bookseller, confessions of a bookseller. So he's like famous in the bookseller indie bookshop world. Also just in general, when I was going to Wigtown, my granny texted me because she knew who he was. She was like, oh, you must go to his bookshop. I did. And actually it's in his bookshop where I found all of these sexy, sexy books. It's all secondhand, lots of antique, lots of vintage books, and there was a small erotic section. I mean, it wasn't even that small, there were still like so many books in it, but compared to the railway section, it was small. These are the books that I bought. <laughs> so pleased with them. I'm just gonna talk you through my sexy erotic secondhand book haul. Let's start with just one on the top. Let's just make this easy for me. We have Fetish 101. Celebrate your fantasies. And this is uh, Dita Von Tees on the front. And I mean, it does what it says on the tin. This isn't one that I'm going to read back to front. It's more of just like a, oh, flicking through like number 25, domination and submission. Isn't so much of life all about this? Boss and employee, teacher and student, rich and poor, master and servant. Some like to give orders and others like to obey. Quite often, such power exchanges can be used to reduce real life stress. In fact, where would dominatrix <laughs> in fact, where would dominatrixes be without their businessman clientele? I don't think I can show you lots of these images. 41, food. 57, harness. 89, vinyl. Three is breasts, and I definitely can't show this on YouTube. So there's this, my little guide to fetishes. Next, and I definitely can't show you images from inside this book, male nudes. This isn't for me. I bought this for my friend Callum. Came over recently, but I was like, I've not filmed the video yet, so I need to keep it and then I'll give it to you. It basically goes through all of the different decades. So it starts in the 19th century. Wow, not even decades. We're going through centuries here. It starts in the 19th century and it's just like old school photography of naked men. And then 1900 to 1920 and all of those. And then it just, it just 1920 to 1940. And there's a lot of dick. You know, there's some interesting photography. Oh, I can show you this one. No penis on this page. Look at these. When, when are these from? The 1990s. Wow. Aww. What angels? Angels. This is a gift. Oh, it's coming up to Christmas. I can tell them it's a Christmas present. Human sexuality, feelings and functions. Um, a life cycle book. So this was published in 1979 and it feels like a bit of a textbook so like the contents is how do we know what we know about sex cultural themes and sexuality sexuality through the life cycle infancy and childhood and then sexuality through the life cycle puberty and adolescence adult sexuality sexual arousal and response performance problems sexual deviance oh i wonder what it counts as sexual deviance in 1979 
Mm. You never know. Sexuality and you. A personal conclusion. Oh, there's some boobies. I like it because, yeah, it is very textbooky and there's lots of pictures. Speaking of the past, next we have the Karma Sutra. Yes, that is right. This is the one that I have read some slash most of because I wrote about it in my dissertation at uni. Fun fact, the Karma Sutra is not a book of sex positions. Oh no. There are seven parts to the Karma Sutra and only one of them is about sex. It was translated into English from the original Sanskrit in the late 19th century. And so it is like a sacred Hindu text. If I'm correct, this is my understanding of it. It's just generally about how to be a good citizen. So like how to be the best person spiritually and all of that good stuff. And you know, sex. Sex is important. Sex is a part of all of that. So the sections are part one, introduction. Just like how to be great, probably. I don't know. Part two, of sexual union. So this is where you learn about all of the ins and outs of sex. I actually did a whole video about the Karma Sutra when I was at uni. So when all of this stuff was a bit more fresh in my mind and I'll link it up there if you fancy watching like me for five, six years ago. Oh God. Part three, about the acquisition of a wife. The book was aimed at men. And yeah, having a wife is an important part of that. Part four, about a wife. I can't remember what the difference is between those two chapters. Now this one, part five, about the wives of other men. And I, I have a funny feeling that it was teaching men how to steal other people's wives, but then also how to make sure that your wife wasn't stolen by someone else, but interesting nonetheless. And then part six is about courtesans. So yeah, I, I guess how I can understand how people would think the entire book is about sex, but a lot of it is just about relationships and navigating society. And then like the second part is the bit where it's like, okay, you're gonna put your penis into the yoni, but not like super like that. It, it does have a lot of emphasis on pleasure, which is great, you know, great stuff. But yes, this is my copy of the Kama Sutra. I never had a copy before because it's out of copyright. So I just read it online. It was like on the archive.org or whatever. I thought it was about time we have a physical copy. Every sex nerd needs a copy of the Kama Sutra on their bookshelf, right? Look, promise you, no pictures, no sex positions. It's all text. Confirmed. Kama Sutra is not a book of sex positions. Right. This one. This is a beast. You're like, Hannah, have you gone mad? Are you ever going to read that? <laughs> I have an idea for how I would read it, but I don't know if that'll ever happen. Look at this. Encyclopedia of Sex Practice by Drs. A. Willie, you can't write this shit, L. Vander and O. Fisher. Okay, so in the preface it says, this book was originally published in the French language in 1933 and had an enormous success. And it has now been translated into several other European languages. It's about 800 pages. The writing is pretty small. We've just opened it onto a page, The Sins of the Male. Ooh. You just know that this is going to be a riveting read. I am just fascinated by like old sex manuals and like what people used to think about sex. They kind of like were being progressive for the time because they were studying it and like treating it as a serious topic for scientific study. But also they were very much ideas of the time. We would be like, wow, that is so ignorant and uh, offensive. But at the time they were just like, this is life. Ooh. And you read it in 2019 and you're like, oh God, this is bad. And you kind of understand why a lot of the stereotypes that we have about sex and different people, different like minority groups and stuff. You kind of, when you understand that these kinds of texts were hugely popular, these were the sex science books that were being written. You're like, oh, this is how a lot of these stereotypes have been so pervasive. Especially because as we, <laughs> as we open the contents page, this is literally how it starts. Sexual art of primitive and other races. We're, it, oh, it's bad. Literally chapter one, sexual rights of primitive peoples. And then chapter two is the Hindus and their love books. And then section two is the erotic life of other races. And it literally has a whole chapter for the yellow races. I don't even know if I should say that. Holy shit. And then the next chapter is the Islamic peoples. The next one is the Jews. I'm actually really intrigued to see what it says about the Jews. Has, has a Jewish person. What are we like sexually? Oh my God. Oh my God. So it like takes you through 
the other races and the primitive peoples. And then the next section, sexual civilization of France. And as I said, it was originally published in French. These are French authors and they're like, ha ha, the primitive peoples and us, the civilized French. Sexuality in children, the sins of youth, from adolescence to manhood, woman's sexual impulse. Oh my God, and then section one is the normal woman. I can't show you this because she's naked, but it's like a drawing of a woman doing like a bridge, like on her back, but her hands aren't on the floor. It's just her head and her feet holding her up. And then the caption is, characteristic attack of severe hysteria. I'm not entirely sure how I'm going to read this while my plans are for reading it. I have this one idea, but again, I have all sorts of ideas all the time and hardly any of them ever come to fruition. But basically I was like, what if I found a friend who wanted to read this with me. And then we kind of do a like, my dad wrote a porno like podcast style thing where we like read through each section and discuss. But I like, I don't know if it would be too offensive. I don't know whether it would actually be really hurtful because of some of the like horrible things it might say about minority groups. Let me know what you think. Should I read this 800 page um, antique sex book? It's only from the 1930s, not even a hundred years ago. The Kama Sutra is probably more woke and that is hundreds of years old. People still say woke, I don't know. Anyway, we have another book. It's not all about that big old antique that I just spent forever talking about. Sex and sexuality. I think we might need to cover this lady up. So this one I'm really excited about. This one, obviously again, is not something that you would read cover to cover because it's what it says. It's a book of quotations. Pick a theme, pick a theme. Go on, go on, give me a theme, give me a theme. Oh, contraception. Interesting, interesting theme choice there. And then it just has like a whole bunch of different quotes from people around and about contraception. I've not read this before, but I've literally seen a quote from Margaret Sanger. She is an American birth control activist and sex educator in the 20th century. Withdrawal has an evil effect upon the woman's nervous condition. She has not completed her desire. She is under a highly nervous tension. Her whole being is perhaps on the verge of satisfaction. She is then left in this dissatisfied state, which is far from humane. Oh my God, brilliant. Here's a great quote. It's not really a quote, it's more just like a one-liner joke by Spike Milligan from The Last Goon Show of All, 1972. Contraceptives should be used on every conceivable occasion. Boom. Anyway, it's great. Let's pick a different theme. Come on, tell me what, what theme do you want? What theme? Come on, uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Oh, sexual fantasies, great theme. Oh, let's do Richard von Kraft Ebbing from Psychopathia Sexualis, 1886. This was another book that I read parts of for my dissertation. She accepted her conjugal duties merely as a matter of unavoidable necessity. Her only condition was that she should be in the upper position. In this position, she obtained a sort of gratification for she imagined his body to be that of a beloved woman <gasps> in the lower position. Oh! Female charms never attracted him. Coitus was only possible when aided by the thought of a beloved man. So here we have a man and a woman having sex with each other, but the man fantasizing about it being a man and the woman fantasizing about him being a woman. I love this shit. I love this shit. I'm having a great time. Well, I hope that you had as much fun in this video as I clearly did. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to support what I do on this channel, there are a few ways that you can do that. One, by just giving this video a thumbs up and commenting below what you thought about all of these books. Also, you can subscribe and hit that notification bell. YouTube Analytics tells me that only 9% of you who are subscribed have hit that notification bell. So. Do that, please. Um, and then also you can support me on Patreon. I'll leave a link in the description for that. Um, there's lots of different perks and rewards that you can get each month um, by joining our lovely community over there. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in my next video. Bye.